Welcome to the Think Fitness Life Podcast, your one-stop shop for exploring the connections between fitness, health, and overall well-being. Join us as we dive deep into all aspects of a balanced and vibrant life, from pushing your limits in the gym to finding peace of mind outside of it. Whether you're a seasoned athlete or just starting your journey, you are in the right place to discover the knowledge and insight to perfect your fitness life. All right, and welcome back to the Think Fitness Life podcast. We have another episode with a guest joining us on. This guest is Dr. Asim. is going to go over the resilience toolbox he has developed in order to keep your heart healthy. Things from managing stress, managing nutrition, managing your daily activities so you can reduce the occurrences of of heart issues. He is a well-known doctor studying electrophysiology of the heart for many years. That's tried and true passion to keeping people healthy and to keeping people going and realizing their full potential. So we, we do really appreciate it. I know it took some time getting you on the show. You're a West Coast guy. I'm an East Coast guy. So the timing sometimes is doesn't line up. But I think last time you had a lot of a lot of patience to to attend to. And one of the things obviously looked you up, went to your website is you're a big proponent of heart health. Mm -hmm. And this is one thing that it gets talked about, but I feel like it gets really lost in translation, especially when it deals with stress and the heart, Mm -hmm. because people think heart health, they think, okay, clogged arteries, all that stuff, which is fair to say, like you have to understand it. But Let's dive into first kind of understanding stress and how people's mental state can really affect their heart. And when we talk about the heart, I assume you're also going to talk about HRV in the overall health of the heart. So uh, to me, it seems like that's really your passion. How did that start for you? Yeah, I was uh, three actually when my dad had his heart attack. He was about 37 at the time. So I woke up in the neighbor's house. You know, where am I? I was totally discombobulated and... My family was all at the hospital, so it was really, really scary. And yeah, I kind of have these scant memories. I was only three. I've actually done some recent cognitive processing therapy, trauma work in regards to that. So a lot of that stuff is kind of being enlightened for me. And then, you know, so growing up, my dad was an oncologist and kind of emotionally disconnected. I mean, a lot of dads, Indian dads, his generation were that way. I think many, I wanted to please my father. So I probably went into medicine for the wrong reasons initially. It was really to please him. I just happened to be good at it. You know, I was into biology and things like that. But there was always this brain side of me, this creative side of me. I did a philosophy major in college, for example. And so you asked about sort of what inspired me. Mm -hmm. So I go through this whole process, get into med school. And really halfway through when I'm in my sophomore year at four o'clock in the morning, I got this call. And it was my uncle, my dad's brother, and my dad and mom had to fly emergently to India. His sister had a stroke. So they dropped everything, ran over there. And then my uncle over the phone said, you know, it seemed your dad's really, really sick. You got to get to India away. And so I dropped everything out again, middle of medical school. I had my exams the next day. And then I started getting ready to go. And my brother called me about 20 minutes later and said, you know, see, dad, they, they, they lied to us. He's actually already dead. And wow. my heart just, I mean, I just, my whole world just shifted and I won't go into the details, but that I think on so many levels, that was such a powerful, it had such a power impact on my mental health. I, I think many who are exposed to acute stress, you compartmentalize. You just have to do what needs to get done. I had to get to India and see my mom. And then afterwards, you know, you had the estate issues to deal with. So I never really dealt with that trauma, but I definitely, I think was inspired, you know, deep down on many levels that in terms of his heart and how I was impacted at such a young age with him having a heart attack and then now having sudden cardiac death when he was 56. And 
it's interesting at the time in med school, I wanted to go into oncology again to kind of please my dad. But then when he died, I was lost. I didn't know if I wanted to continue medicine and you know, there were a lot of doubts. And it was really in the coronary care unit at Stanford when I did my residency that I was exposed to the intellectual side of cardiology. I loved, you know, patients would come in with heart attacks. We'd open up the vessels with angioplasty and stenting. We would often resuscitate people from cardiac arrest and not, never really realizing that, you know, that's what my dad went through, you know, and it was just like a lot of things in life. I think you could probably relate, Eric, is you know, when people take an interest in you or you find mentors from different walks of life, you kind of go down that passion. And so there was a, one of the attending physicians who was a cardiac electrophysiologist. So he was a, he was a cardiologist, but he specialized in heart rhythm disorders. He took an interest in me. We just started talking one day and we wrote a paper together. And that's what I ended up going into is a branch of cardiology called electrophysiology, a heart rhythm specialist. And what, one of the things that we do is we specialize in prevention and treatment of cardiac arrest amongst other things. So it's interesting how this thing has come around full circle that I didn't really think about it at the time, but, you know, deep down, I think I felt such a lack of control in what happened to my dad and how he was just sort of ripped out of our lives that in some ways I chose to pursue a passion, which gave me as much of a sense of control as I could possibly have with you and I both knowing there's actually very little in life we can control. Mm -hmm. But, but I think, you know, the, it was the intellectual part initially about the heart that fascinated me. You got this personal journey. And then I think that, you know, now I'm 54, two years away from him and when he died and I have really finally started to deal with some of these, these mental and emotional traumas that afflicted me when I was much, much younger. And I see so often in my patients who have heart disease, the impact that that can have on them mentally, emotionally, like dad, when he had his heart attack, he didn't want to, he didn't want to participate in life. You know, he, he saw himself as brittle. He didn't play with us in the backyard. He didn't want to, you know, do sports with us. When we would go out to eat, he'd take all the cheese off of the pizza. He just... I think he just went mm -hmm. to the other extreme and we see so many people go through that because, you know, when your heart's affected, it's like you feel like your life is over in many ways. And so, you know, you kind of brought it, brought it up the point that, you know, there's, there's the heart as an organ and then there's the heart as a system and there's the organic heart, but then there's also the emotional heart in many cultures. You know, you, you think of the heart as sort of the center of your chest and the source of love and the source of compassion. And what we know, and, and you kind of mentioned a little bit with heart rate variability, what we know with the heart is that it's one of three brains in the body. You got your, your real brain, your central nervous system. You got your heart, which is part of the cardiac nervous system. And then you got your gut, which is the enteric nervous system. And I think there's something to be said for when people feel things in their heart, there's a certain intuition that the heart as an organ can have. And so much of that has to do with its interaction with the autonomic nervous system with your fight or flight response. And, you know, we can get into that a little bit, but I've, I've really found this connection between heart and mind to be a fascinating thing. And I think so much of it was personally driven, you know, personally and professionally driven. Oh, for, I would assume so, because especially when, when we talk about autonomics, that is the, one of the biggest drivers of us as humans. And a lot of times I, I really don't think people understand you and I do, this is our world but they don't understand what autonomics is and how it influences that heart rate variability or how it influences that. I, sometimes it's hard to describe that feeling in your chest when you're, when you're sad or you're happy, that's your, your vagus nerve being stimulated from the autonomic nervous system. And you you have these, these systems, these three brains talking to each other, but it's a big empowering point to really emphasize okay he, people need to take heart health serious and when when things stress or any sort of fight or flight or even if it's good stress come in the heart is going to be effective that's one thing the overall system people he said they'll look at heart attacks and they'll say oh i can't exercise i can't eat cheese i, I got to take this stuff but it's it's a systematic thing mm -hmm. absolutely you know you probably heard of broken heart sy syndrome or takotsubo cardiomyopathy you know, it's where acute emotional or mental stress literally causes the heart to change shape from its normal football shape to a circular shape, to a spherical shape. And 
it will simulate a heart attack. So mm -hmm. people get diagnosed as having a heart attack or acute congestive heart failure. And it's often reversible when that stress is over. So you'll hear often when people lose a loved one or whatever. So that's one of the most powerful examples of how the autonomic nervous system, because you know, when you get that emotional mental response, you have the surge of uh, cortisol, you have the surge of norepinephrine, you have the surge of all the stress hormones and everything in life is a balance. Stress is good. Stress is just any kind of pressure that occurs to an environment or a system, whether it's internal, external, whether it's in your physical body, whether it's in your emotional health or your mental health, but, or your social health, your relationships can undergo stress. And so you have eustress, which is good stress, and then you have distress, which is bad stress. And there's the York Stopson model. There's a bunch of different models that have kind of looked at, you know, where's that sweet spot? You know, because athletes, for example, I mean, there's a sweet spot of revving up your autonomic nervous system, but you want to, you want to have a body and a mind that is able to gear up for stress when it needs to gear up, but then not get caught up in it later in the day. So if you have a fight or something, you know, there, there's, there's a role for anger, but you don't want that to carry over into your evening. And that's where things, you know, I think heart rate variability is such an underused metric in the practice of medicine. I think partly because we, we don't have a lot of validated studies in clinical practice that say, if you have a patient with X amount of stress that is measurable and you employ X technique, whether it's meditation, mindfulness, yoga, what have you, and, and you see this impact on the heart rate variability of this change, this delta, that it's going to have some kind of uh, prognostic significance or have a lower rate of development of disease or a lower rate of hospitalization or whatever. We just, we don't, we're not at that level yet. And I think part of the challenge is that you have so many companies with so many different biometrics out there. You know, Apple obviously is one of the big ones, but Garmin and, you know, Samsung and all these other companies have ways of measuring Fitbit, have ways of measuring heart rate variability, but it's still, there's not a uniformed agreement. I think most would agree that it's a metric that's underutilized. You know, mm -hmm. heart rate and blood pressure are very simple parameters that so many things impact, but you know, heart rate variability. So, you know, you have your pulse and you, you have this variation in the pulse of, of milliseconds here and milliseconds there that have, there's so many things that impact that. But when you're in a high stress state in a chronic high stress state, your adrenaline levels are elevated and your vagus nerve is underactive. The, the tone of the vagus system, the parasympathetic nervous system is reduced. I think of it almost like seesaw, you know, there's times that your body, you need on one side of the seesaw, you have your sympathetic nervous system, fight or flight response, flight, fight or freeze. And then your parasympathetic nervous system, rest and digest, rest and relax response. And there's a purpose to both of them. And it's not that, you know, again, it's about what do you need in that moment and, and how do you, how do you recalibrate? How do you sort of reset yourself that, you know, later in the day, if you have a stressful event or something that you can reset. So you're not carrying that stress, not just in your mind, because if you're carrying it in your mind and your emotions, you are carrying it within your cardiovascular system. There was a study that showed that when people were exposed to really violent images, and they measured the evoke potentials, which are measurements of electrical activity in the heart and the brain. They measured both. That the heart's sensation of those images showing up as recorded electrical activity in the heart, changes in heart rate and blood pressure preceded the changes in the brain's activity. So your heart is literally perceiving external stimuli quicker in your cardiovascular system quicker than your uh, central nervous system you know, then you can actually perceive it or even put it into words. It's almost like built in. So that, that is meant to happen. So you can react to something. I'm thinking way back our ancestors survival. Okay. That system's already primed. Then it can create a reaction to it. Boom. Now the problem is nowadays, these reactions are usually from a cell phone and people right. don't know how to shut them off. And it's like, right. what are we doing? And I do want to circle back because I, I found that what you said interesting, how the heart changes shape. Mm -hmm. And is that similar to the, the high rates of cortisol? You know how you know glial cells can die in the brain? Is that mm -hmm. very similar? What are the mechanisms of why that heart changes? Like what's, the, what's the adaptation significance of that, of a system to change its shape? It's for survival. 
you know, so when there's enough of a stress to, in the case of Takotsubo cardiomyopathy, mm -hmm. when there's enough of a, of a, of a surge of stress hormones, changing the shape helps because part of the heart muscle is literally sort of transiently dying. So there's parts of the heart that aren't working properly. So in order to compensate for those parts that aren't working properly, the, the heart changes shape to maintain its cardiac output, to maintain its performance. Gotcha. So it's, it's maximizing its shape to just keep its job going. To keep its job going. Oh. I mean, that, and that's, you know, that's on a sort of an organ level, but we see that in people, we see that in cities, we see that in countries. There's a, you know, it, it's almost like, you know, I think our bodies and the cells within our bodies are sort of this microcosm of what really happens in the world. You know, this is getting a little off topic, but I just kind of, you know, as we're sort of having this conversation, I, I, I think about the emotional, mental, physical turmoil we have in ourselves and how it's reflected in nature. You know, I don't think it's a coincidence. Like granted, you know, there's climate change. That's a very real thing. I think that there is something to be said for all the conflict within human beings nowadays and the sort of conflict that's happening in nature. And, you know, that, and, you know, if, if I were to talk to one of my colleagues, they would mm -hmm. be, you know, laughing at me because this stuff is not talked about in Western medicine. And I think right. the reason why I'm attracted to it is well, I come from an Indian background, so I have some experience with Ayurvedic medicine, but then also I think because I went through major burnout, major depression and anxiety, and what I'm realizing is so much of it actually had to do with trauma from my dad's death, that I needed to put together what I call a resilience toolbox. I needed a set of tools and strategies that I could turn to that when you know, I'm about ready to scrub in on a complex cardiac surgery that I have a way in which I can keep calm, that I can keep, you know, calm under pressure. And there's, there's a part of us that just automatically does that because you know, you know, you know what you need to do, but at the same time, it can have, it, it can have negative effects over time. Any kind of anxiety, any kind of stress can have negative effects over time. So I think I started exploring these things, you know, that's kind of how I came across, you know, heart math technology, you know, and, and there are one of many companies out there that are using things like heart rate variability and, and incorporating it as a way of building resilience within your system, within your body, within your mind, within your, within your physical body. And so I think that, you know, in this age of biometrics and data, um, we, we can definitely use that to our advantage, but I do think, you know, you brought up a good point, which is in the past the stresses that our ancestors had were, were threatening their physical survival. You know, that's why we're, we're, we're social beings, because if you were outside of the group, you were more likely to die. So mm -hmm. that's why we always want to be within the group. But in the same way, you know, if you're running away from a T-Rex or saber tooth tiger or whatever, our primitive brains were evolved to help us stay alive and help us procreate. And I think now the kinds of stresses we have, it's difficult for parts of our brain to sort it out, you know, that a fight at work, you're having some of the same physiologic changes occurring within your brain and within your body than would occur when you're, when you're actually in physical threat. And I think a lot of the way that you shift that in your own life is learning to just kind of become aware of those things, you know, before changing anything, the first step is almost to do an inventory of, and that's where I find journaling in particular helpful, you know, any kind of reflection exercise to really be thinking about, you know, through your day, you know, things like gratitude practice and things that, that have been shown to have benefit, but just really thinking about it, I show up today and without trying to judge yourself, but just to say, you know, what are the things that I am being reactive about and how can I go from a place of being reactive to making conscious choices? And I think one of the things that a lot of people don't realize is it only takes a couple of minutes a day to build up this mental muscle and emotional muscle memory of creating a new pathway for how you perceive stress in life that, that you can go from places of reactivity and, you know, whether it's through mindfulness, whether it's through a lot of people have various forms of their meditation, my friend, you know, he cycles, that's his form of meditation. But I think, 
know, there's a great quotes that, you know, are attributed to Victor Frankl. You know, he says in his book, Man's Search for Meaning, between stimulus and response, there's that space where you can actually make, you know, decisions, conscious decisions. That's good. That's my favorite book. <laughs> yeah, it's one of the I, I love that book. And to tie that all together, because I think you you mentioned one point that I, I want to circle back to yet again. It'll be a kind of recurring thing. I'll circle back to it and tie it in. Is the that maybe it was a reach to some people where you said climate, environment, human, it's all connected. In Western medicine, I am with you. I feel they miss out on this because they're treating biometrics and I love numbers and I love data, but they're they're missing that part of what you just said. What are people doing? And it doesn't have to be long each day. What are they doing to allow their system to detensify? Whether it's meditation, gratitude, and a lot of times what I talk about with a lot of people is frequencies. There's all frequencies in this mm -hmm. world. So if you're this world's running on high frequencies, you're going to have high tension, high stress. Mm -hmm. So to be able to, to decrease those frequencies, we have brain frequencies, electrical frequencies, it's all tied together. So when you say that, you know, it is all connected, I'm there with you because it's just people need to understand that this this world and nature is a lot more intricate than we actually think. I was just getting into the, have you ever heard of the hidden message of water and no. sort of, sort of how water changes vibrations and structure based on certain frequencies, based on certain attitudes. So it's all this, this thought of, okay, we are all a system that's working off of pressure frequencies tension that if it stays in this locked tense state we're gonna have chronic stress and unfortunately it's it's inevitable to avoid we live in a world from social media to you know people driving and being mad at us but it, it's the ability like you said to let it go to have something where you can say i'm gonna shut this down and I'm going to turn down the frequencies, what's going to turn down the frequencies and it's going to decrease stress, which is going to help the heart. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, this, you know, this notion of frequencies, I love because I, I play music, I play guitar, and I really think of so much of life as this harmonization of different rhythms. And, you know, we can use whatever, you know, sort of construct that we want, but what we're really talking about is it's this tension in life between chaos and order and, and how, you know, there's, there are things called mirror neurons that we have in our brains where you're literally responsive to the person that you're in front of. If, if people make a certain kind of facial expression or a certain change in body language, we have a tendency to match that. That's why you can have something called emotional contagion where you're in a meeting and someone comes in that meeting and they're in a really bad mood. There is a way in which that just, permeates the entire room in the same way you can actually make a change in yourself and i think you know mama gandhi said it sort of be the change that you want to see in the world you know and this stuff doesn't get talked about i think as much in my culture of medicine mainly because you said you know a lot of it's focused on data a lot of it's focused on you know scientific credibility and mm -hmm. validation which is all legit. It's all oh, legit. Yeah. But I think there's a part that we have really thrown away from, and it's through no one's fault. I mean, some of it, honestly, a lot of it is the way healthcare has gone. I mean, you know, we have 15 minute appointments maybe with Jeez. patients. I, I, I feel so bad for my primary care colleagues because my, my area of coverage is very specialized. Like, you know, I, I specialize in atrial fibrillation. It's one of the most common heart rhythm disorders worldwide, causes stroke and heart failure. And a lot of my visits are all about atrial fibrillation. And there's a lot of experience that we see where mental and emotional stress can trigger heart rhythm disturbances and vice versa. But my, our primary care colleagues have to deal with, you know, 20 different medical problems in someone in a 10 minute visit. I mean, it's no wonder the burnout rates and depression mm -hmm. rates are so high in healthcare, but, you know, I think, I don't know about you, Eric, but I think for me individually, it took me falling really hard, being in a really dark place 
to finally have my eyes open to, you know, cause I tried these different things over time, you know, I would try exercise and I try all these different things and all of those things help, but it was really when a friend invited me to a meditation retreat, that was a big game changer for me. And then when I started looking into trauma research and realizing that we all carry with us traumas since birth that, you know, there's trauma with a big T and then there's trauma with a little T and trauma is stored in our bodies in multiple different places. You know, there's a great book, body keeps the score. And I noticed myself that I carry this chronic neck tension on the left side. And a lot of it has to do with the ergonomics in the room where I'm doing surgery. But I notice that when I meditate and those muscles relax, mm -hmm. the stress suddenly gets released. You know, there's a reason why in yoga, there's a lot of hip opening uh, poses because a lot of the stress in our body is stored in our hips. So, and I think it's, you know, I have to think of myself as trying to bridge a little bit of that East and West, because there's a lot to be said for, you know, why do certain cultures, you know, live so long, you know, so much of it, you know, why, why do you have some of the happiest countries in the world? Also those that have the lowest GNP and there's actually a metric, you know, gross national happiness, GNH. And so I don't know. Yeah. I mean, we're getting a little philosophical, but I do think it all does tie back to our hearts, not, you know, not just from a cardiovascular physical standpoint, but from just a compassionate standpoint, you know, being compassionate with each other. When you, and you mentioned you use some of these tools in your resilience toolbox. Do you transfer that over when you meet with patients? Do you yeah. transfer this toolbox of all we just talked about yeah. over to, to what their ability to do to either prevent or to recover from heart issues? I do. I, I do have to admit it's a work in progress because mm -hmm. any typical person, especially in, in healthcare as cardiologists, we want to fix things. So when people start telling us a set of symptoms, I want to immediately come in there and say, well, you can do, you can do this meditation and you can do this. And then I started to realize <laughs> that, is, that is overwhelming for people. Yeah. And you need to meet people where they're at. And so probably the one of the most effective things to do that I've learned is to learn to just really be quiet and just kind of pay attention, look at their body language, mindfully listen, pick up on something that they're saying, and then try to tie it back to something, you know, that I think would be helpful. I've done, uh, I, I remember there was a guy, his name was Dan, and he's a really tall, big guy. And he has really been struggling quite a bit with chronic anxiety and he's developed all of these different physical issues. And I did some heart surgery on him. And while that got better, just all the anxiety just got worse and worse. And he just, he literally broke down in my office and, you know, here I was, I was already writing, oh, writing 20 minutes behind and I had to make a decision. You know, this is a human being in front of me. I got to step outside of my job as a doctor and, first of all, just help this person as best as I can. So I just kind of looked at him in the eye and I just let him kind of let it out. And I just said, Dan, stop, close your eyes, take some deep breaths with me. And we just took three deep breaths together and you could see it on his face. It just took him down several notches. And I got to say, when I first came out of training at Stanford, like, there's no way I would have done stuff like that. I probably would have just been kind of a jerk and probably just said, okay, all right, we're done. Why don't you mm -hmm. go talk to your, why don't you go talk to your primary care physician about your issues? And I'm not saying we, we have time for doing these things, but I've noticed as I've advanced in my career, as I've encountered my own set of challenges or witnessed other people and their suffering that, you know, you, you, you really don't realize, you know, how much time you have left and what your challenges are going to be. And so, the best thing that you can do is really kind of take stock of, you know, how is your, your mind, your emotions, your body doing on a day-to-day -day basis, on a moment-to-moment -moment basis. And it's, it's, it's worth the time. That's the paradox is you know, how many of us, when you know you should exercise, you know you'll feel better if you exercise, but you don't. And it's the same way. You know that if you meditate for a few minutes, it'll make a big difference, you know, and I think that it's just hard. I think the key is making micro steps and helping people along the way and allowing them to sort of say, you know what, it's okay that I didn't meditate these five days out of the week because I did it that one day. 
you know, or, and, and that's how you really effectively create habit change is you got to, you have to have a sense of empowerment and you have to have a sense of progress, but you also have to have some leeway built into it, you know? Oh, for sure. What, and what other, along the toolbox, what other tools for, for heart health de-stressing that you have in your toolbox? I would say music is a big one for me because mm -hmm. music, I think, you know, is so fundamental to us as human beings. And so for me, worship music in particular has been very valuable. So, you know, my spiritual life is pretty strong and I think I inherited a lot of that from my parents and I kind of bridge two faiths, Hinduism and Christianity. And so I find that to be a very, very grounding place for me. The other night, the, the other thing about spirituality is it brings you in connection with other people. And I think that as part of that toolbox, it, it needs to be social connection. There's a lot of data that shows that our relationships are some of the biggest predictors of overall well-being and health. And so putting that effort into at least making some kind of connection on a day-to-day -day basis, if you can, even if it's a quick text to a friend or whatever it is, that's in the toolbox. Obviously, physical exercise, yoga is a big one. Yoga has, was a game changer for me when I started doing that. There's a lot of data that shows that yoga you know, lowers heart rate and blood pressure, helps in heart rate variability. It helps reduce the risk of atrial fibrillation, amongst other things. I would say that the mindfulness practices, meditation. So I kind of have my daily routine and sleep. Sleep's a big one. Sleep's one that, you know, there's a lot of interest in nowadays in terms of sleep research and how much we don't realize how important sleep is in us on so many different levels, you know, and it, and it seems common sense, but I've struggled a lot with my sleep. Interestingly, when I started doing this trauma therapy, you know, you get these really vivid dreams and you sort of are reliving a lot of this stuff and it started impacting my sleep. So I started then exploring, okay, what are ways in which I can improve my sleep hygiene, you know? And then I start sharing those with my patients because you find out that a lot of people struggle with their sleep. So yeah, in that resilience toolbox would be, you know, social connections, music, uh, exercise, sleep, being in nature. You know, there's something called forest bathing, which is from Japanese culture, but just being out in nature and feeling the ground under your feet and being in connection with, with life outside of you, with sort of this bigger world outside of you. I think so much of it, so much of these things gets you out of your head because we spend so much of our time in our head when we're talking to people. What's the next thing I'm going to say? How am I going to respond with me with you now? There's a part of me, there's that circuit in me that's saying, okay, what question is Eric going to ask me next? <laughs> and how am I going to come up with the response? And then you don't even start to pay attention to what you're trying to say. And so I think that, you know, these, these different tools, these different techniques, they evolve over time. So for a while, meditation was my thing, but then over time, and I think humans, we, we need some variability. We need some mixing up of things. And some days you're going to just fall. Some days you're just going to have not so great days. And I think just the more that you, you know, that's why I'm, I'm so f fascinated with the idea of when people undergo trauma, what causes some people to grow and blossom and what causes some people to spiral down? You know, and I think so much of it has to do with our social support networks. And that's where I think, you know, something like a pandemic really taught us what happens to human beings when you isolate them from each other. I mean, you know, look at, look at the, it was a big global experiment of like, look at how we fall apart, you know, from a social aspect. I mean, and that all affects all these neurotransmitters that affects yeah. everything we're talking to from the standpoint of overall health, especially heart health. Yeah, like, like oxy oxytocin. The sorry to cut you off. What were you going to say? No, I was going to say what. What especially let's talk. I mean, talking the pandemics. What did you see the effects on the hearts that you were starting to see? Yeah, it was it was really interesting. People were so terrified to go to the emergency room that they were having heart attacks and strokes at home. It was Oof. sad. So I think that was part of the challenge in the pandemic is that we were so focused on the mortality of COVID, which was huge. Don't get me wrong. Right. But we were forgetting the the day-to-day the -day stuff that kills people. You know, heart disease, heart disease is still one of the number one killers. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I would say that, you know, a lot of times when people have a heart issue develop, whether it's my dad with a heart attack or a heart failure or bypass surgery, 
it really changes a person's self-perception of themselves. It, you know, they can often feel broken. They can often feel, you know, there's, there's, there's literally, you know, it's not just a mental, there's, there's, you said kind of on a neurotransmitter level, you know, there's, there can be different areas of the brain that start to light up more than others, you know, and I think that it's important to sort of honor that it's okay to feel that way. I think normalizing your, your emotions, you know, whether they're positive or negative is, is really, really important. And I think opening up to people, which is really hard to do. I mean, especially in certain disciplines, but I, I like to think of vulnerability as the new superpower. I would say that, you know, in the heart patients, especially with the pandemic, besides not wanting to come to the hospital and seek medical care, you just saw people having exacerbations of their condition. So for the people who had heart rhythm problems, they would develop bad palpitations, racing heartbeat, you know, and some of it was not cardiac. Some of it was just their adrenaline system and their fight or flight system was out of balance. But some of it was cardiac because when I deal with heart arrhythmias and abnormal heart rhythm, people can go into, they can have a short circuit and their heart rate can go 180 beats a minute and it'll cause them to feel panicked. And, you know, we would see that. I remember a lady, really sweet lady who she has a pacemaker, which is another thing that I, I specialize in. And I remember she could not see her daughter. They did not allow her daughter into the nursing home. And I remember she just got progressively more and more depressed. You know, I think the pandemic really sh shown this big light on mental health. And it's sad that it took an ER physician taking her own life to, mm -hmm. to make Congress actually pass a law to protect healthcare providers, their mental health. But Lorna Breen, I mean, her sacrifice and her brother, you know, lobbied for the Congress to pass the Lorna Breen Act. And I think there just, there's so many examples of how, I mean, if you look at the suicide rate amongst physicians pre and post pandemic, and then you look at our teens, I mean, you mentioned social media. I mean, there's just all of the stuff out there, but the, the challenge is that just technology is everywhere and technology has a lot of great advantages, but it's almost like, I think we also need to kind of, you know, in different ways, hold each other accountable so that when I'm, when I know that it's good for me to go to bed at nine and not look at, you know, <laughs> electronics at one or two hours before bedtime, that my wife calls me on it. She says, you were supposed to go to bed in an hour. Why are you looking at your phone? You know, we need to do a little bit more of that. It's hard. I mean, you know, when I start having fights with people, but it, it is an important thing. Looking for personalized workout plans? Whether you prefer to train at home or hit the gym, Try a 14-day free trial of the Think Fitness Life mobile app. Get customized workouts, nutrition guidance, and coaching from a qualified professional who will be in your corner every step of the way. Visit www.thinkfitnesslife.com to start your free trial today. That's www.thinkfitnesslife.com. Oh, absolutely, for sure. And... Talking kind of want to dive into the heart here because I know that's your your thing. When it comes to AFib, can you explain that for the listeners? Like what yeah. that is and, and why why specifically did you choose AFib? I always like to know because we all pick uh, people in our industry to pick these passions of what we like to yeah. gear things towards, especially that because and then also I'm gonna throw a lot at you here and then I'll unpack. I remember years ago and I I I'm looking at my notes here, I'm trying to find it. There are there two different kind of heart attacks. You have a myocardial infarction, and then you have what's the other one? Oh, I think you're talking about STEMI versus non-STEMI. So yeah. there's ST elevation myocardial infarction, mm. which has to do with the EKG, correct? You'll see ST segment elevation or peak T waves. That usually has to do with what we call a transmural heart attack, where when the blood supply is cut off from a clot thrombus, you will mm -hmm. have the entire thickness of the heart muscle die as opposed to what we call a sub endocardial myocardial infarction or non-STEMI, where it, it's not all the way through the thickness of the heart muscle. And usually the, the non-STEMI is not as life-threatening as the STEMI. But yeah, I mean, you know, what got me into atrial fibrillation was really, you know, so much of my field in electrophysiology is technology driven, and I'm just fascinated with technology. And so I think that when I was going into cardiology and I saw there was this branch called electrophysiology, we use so much of our mind, we use a lot of deductive reasoning. So that pulled upon from my philosophy major in college. You know, we, we study the, the patterns. I mean, the heart rhythm is the rhythm of life. And so 
with atrial fibrillation, I, you start to realize that, I mean, almost 6 million Americans, if not more, have AFib now. One in four people over the age of 40, one in four people over the age of 40, at one point in their life are going to get AFib. It's arthritis of the electrical system. You get... I, I didn't realize it was that high. Yeah, no, it's it's a very... Like it's, it's estimated in the next several decades, it's going to be about 16 million Americans alone. Oh, so, so the number one risk factor... So atrial fibrillation is a chaotic electrical rhythm of the heart where the heart, you know, rather than beating in a nice stable fashion will be fast, will be slow, will be irregular. And what's happening is the top chamber of the heart, in particular, the left atrium, the top left chamber, fibrillates, it quivers. So rather than going 60 beats a minute, seven beats a minute, it's going almost 600 beats a minute in a very ineffectual contraction. So what happens is because that chamber is not contracting well, well, what happens to blood when it's not moving? It pools. And when blood pools, it forms a clot. So with AFib, the clot forms in the heart and then travels to different parts of the body to cause various kinds of events. So embolic events. And so most commonly it's, it's the head. So stroke is one of the most common presentations for AFib. And in fact, when you have people come to the hospital with a stroke, there's a good percentage of the time that we can't find the cause. It's called cryptogenic. Hmm. There are the carotids aren't blocked. There's not a blockage in their head. It's not a bleed in the brain. It's not a hypertensive emergency. It's actually atrial fibrillation. So atrial fibrillation wow. is this great ma masquerader. You can have silent AFib. Very commonly, people, especially as they get older, if they're not active, they can have AFib and not realize it. Because with AFib, so it's different with the electrical system compared to the coronary arteries. With the coronary arteries, it's plumbing. You've got three arteries, and if they get blocked up, by and large, you get symptoms, whether it's chest discomfort, shortness of breath. You do have groups of patients, women and diabetics, that don't have classic symptoms. But by and large, most people who are having a heart attack, there is some symptomatology. But with the electrical system, it's like taking your car to the mechanic. You can have it act up at times. But then when you go into the doctor's office to have an EKG or your heart listened to, your rhythm may be normal. And so AFib starts by something called paroxysmal AFib, where you go in and out of it. You have these abnormal circuits in your heart that form, and it feeds on itself. The heart's a muscle. It has a muscle memory. So every time you have an episode of AFib, the cells in the heart change to actually make it easier to have more AFib. So there's a term AFib begets AFib. And the challenge with AFib is progressive. And so if it's not detected early, you will eventually go into AFib and stay in AFib. And that's called persistent AFib. So I like to use the analogy of cancer or the metaphor of cancer. Early on in cancer, it's limited to a, a area, but then it, if the cells are allowed to grow, they, they replicate to the point that they get metastatic. And in the same way, if we use that analogy with AFib, we have different treatments depending on where you are in the disease process. So if you're early on, if you're paroxysmal, we look at lifestyle. There's certain mm -hmm. things that can act as triggers for AFib that we can talk about. And then we look at the disease and there's different treatments we have. Sometimes we have medication. We have a procedure called ablation, which I do a lot of to eliminate the circuits. We have pacemakers. We have a procedure called cardioversion where we shock the heart back into rhythm. That's my book uh, that I published on AFib is called Restart Your Heart. And it's sort of born from that idea of, of shocking the heart back, back into rhythm. But, you know, what really kind of, I think, really interested me about AFib is it presents in all of these different ways and all these sneaky ways. And so the number one risk factor for AFib is age. It's just like you get scar tissue in your joints, you get scar tissue in your electrical system. When scar tissue interfaces with interfaces with normal electrical tissue in the heart, it creates these short circuits. So there's four veins in the heart on the backside, top left chamber, left atrium, there's four veins that bring blood from the lungs, newly oxygenated blood back to the left side of the heart. So it's pumped out to the rest of the body. These are called the pulmonary veins. And pulmonary veins have these abnormal AFib circuits in them. And they form, I mentioned age is a risk factor. Other top risk factors are high blood pressure, Obesity is a big one. So we have an obesity epidemic in America. That's why we're seeing more and more people getting AFib. Obesity is an epidemic. Diabetes, thyroid disease, sleep apnea is huge. 50% of people who have atrial fibrillation have sleep apnea, have undiagnosed sleep apnea. Sleep apnea can present with snoring, but there's also central sleep apnea, which has to do with your brainstem. So you stop breathing and you may not know, and your partner may not know, and your main symptoms are you just feel tired all the time. So we have a low threshold to check for sleep apnea in our AFib patients. 
Other uh, risk factors include any kind of heart disease. So if you've had a heart attack, if you have valve heart disease, a narrowed valve, aortic stenosis, alcohol turns out to be terrible for the heart's electrical system. So while a glass of red wine, there may be data on that being positive for the, car for the coronaries, for the electrical system, alcohol causes a drops in potassium and magnesium, which make your heart electrical system unstable cause you to be dehydrated, which acts as a trigger for heart arrhythmias. And with the case of atrial fibrillation, there was a study out of University of California, San Francisco, where they gave intravenous alcohol. They dripped a little bit of alcohol <laughs> ethanol, during an ablation procedure, and they put a catheter in the heart. And they measured the electrical activity, and they saw these acute changes in the cells, in the measurements of the cell's electrical measurements called refractory period, showing that it was easier for those cells to go into atrial fibrillation. So I'm not very popular in this regard, but I advise my patients <laughs> to avoid alcohol because it turns out it's a great way to lose weight too. So you get a double yeah. benefit and you lower your, your, you lower your blood pressure and you get better sleep because alcohol, while it may be a CNS depressant is a cardiovascular stimulant. So, you know, those, those are kind of, so I think of AFib, I think of a fire. Okay. And then I think of the risk factors as the wood. So whether it's high blood pressure, whether it's diabetes, as those get out of control, the wood gets drier and drier and easier to form a fire. And then there are the matches. The matches would be what we started this podcast about, stress. So mm -hmm. stress is a big trigger for atrial fibrillation because you get that adrenaline, you get that cortisol. Those have direct impact into the heart's electrical system to the point that when I do a procedure on AFib ablation, I actually give intravenous adrenaline called isoproterenol during the procedure to try to get the arrhythmia to happen. So that's basically creating stress within the heart. I can create stress within the heart. So yeah, it's a, it's an interesting, so you have these different matches. You have dehydration, you have lack of sleep, you have, you know, thyroid disease, any of those things. So that's the best way to kind of think about the heart's electrical system. And there's other rhythms related to atrial fib. There's atrial flutter, there's supraventricular tachycardia. There's rhythms that cause cardiac arrest that cause people to drop dead. You know, cardiac arrest is still one of the number one causes uh, of, of sudden death. And in many cases, it's due to a heart attack where the blocked artery just basically causes the electrical system go haywire. But, you know, we've made major progress. We've identified people at higher risk, people with heart failure. We have AEDs everywhere. We now know athletes, you know, there's athletes that are at risk for sudden death. So we, mm -hmm. you know, we have now the ability to screen athletes for conditions such as hypertrophic cardiomyopathy or long QT syndrome. These are conditions that cause sudden death in young people, you know, so in what I do, we have kind of, we have expertise in areas of heart arrhythmias, whether they're in the top chamber, atrial fib or bottom chamber, cardiac arrest, ventricular fibrillation or ventricular tachycardia. And then we have expertise in devices, pacemakers, which are used for slow heart rate and implantable defibrillators, which are used for rapid, you know, unstable heart rate. And again, this is a, an, an interesting example of how I didn't think about it at the time when I went into electrophysiology, but what I do for a living in implanting defibrillators would have saved my dad if he had a defibrillator. He would, if he had a defibrillator, he would have gotten shocked and been rescued. And so it's interesting how you know, whether that was, you know, whether that's just happenstance mm. or whether that was just sort of some deep seated, you know, growth that occurred from the trauma that wanted to make a difference for other people. But, you know, it's still, you know, these things are still really common. And yeah, I, I can guarantee you if your listeners just started talking to someone and mentioning the word AFib, chances are either they're going to have it, they're going to know someone who has it, they're going to have a family member who has it because it is very, very common. And like I said, I mean, just getting older itself is a risk factor for having atrial fib. I've operated on physicians in my medical group who have a, anyone can get it. So it's, it's, it's fascinating. This is a realm that, I mean, that's why obviously we wanted to have you on because I've never thought about electrophysiology like that before. And what you mentioned is age, high blood pressure, obesity, so let's say the top three, and they all, they all loop to that it puts stress on the system mm -hmm. yeah. and our system goes back to the frequency in, you know, electricity, like our system runs off of that. Mm -hmm. Now I know it's going to change all the different neurotransmitter catecholamines, you know, sodium, potassium levels, all that, but it's just fascinating that all this stuff can really hit home when it comes to overall health. 
and most people think like, oh, okay, you know, I'm obese, diabetes, but they never look at the heart. They just look at, okay, yeah. what are the symptoms of obesity, diabetes, high blood pressure? Oh, okay. Well, I can manage it with medication to affect one thing, but really it's looking at this overall autonomic nervous system. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I think this is going to tie in, but it, this might be a far reach when you, when you say age is number one, and then you mention high blood pressure, obesity, and people overweight. Well, mm -hmm. that's been shown to increase the aging process from free radicals, all this stuff. So I assume that would be correlated to seeing that number of people at it, maybe a younger age starting to develop this earlier because maybe their chronological age isn't where it's older, but their their insides, their mitochondrial, yeah. they're they're aging faster than their actually body yeah. is. Yeah, no, absolutely. And the organ fat is a good is a good measure, really, of of some of that because people can look on the outside thin, but they can have a lot of organ fat. But yeah, you know, any kind of oxidative stress to the body will cause cell death, which will result in scar tissue. And in, you know, this occurs in every organ of the body, including the heart and the scar tissue in the heart creates abnormal circuits and, and cardiac arrhythmias. You know, it's, it is interesting. The, the brain and the heart are very, very similar. They have very similar disease processes. So if you think about it, like stroke or blocked a thrombus or a blocked ar artery in the brain and a heart attack, you know, in both cases, part of that area dies and does not regenerate, yeah. you know, but but what can happen is you can have cells around it find new paths so you know we know with with the brain we have neuroplasticity we know you can form new neural connections or different neural connections and we know in the heart you know a lot of the studies that have been done with beta blockers for example beta blocker medications that have shown that you can actually have positive remodeling of the heart so if you have an area of the heart muscle that dies you can have other areas recruit and get stronger and what are beta blockers? Beta blockers are anti-adrenaline drugs. So this whole fight or flight response, you know, beta blockers block the negative impact. You know, this is the interesting thing about heart disease. So when your heart is failing, okay, when you have congestive mm -hmm. heart failure, where you have, you know, fluid in, in your body building up and you have two kinds or systolic and diastolic, but we don't have to get into that. But when you go into heart failure, one of the first things that happens is your heart rate goes up because you know your heart's just trying to keep up if the heart muscle is not pumping properly there's only there's something called cardiac output which is the pump performance of your heart and there's basically two things you know there's heart rate and there, there's heart rate and there's stroke volume and stroke volume is the amount of blood you pump per minute but then the 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 heart the heart rate is one of the few ways that the heart can get more blood out so when the heart's failing and the heart rate goes up the what happens is your your body your body is basically producing more adrenaline because it's sort of trying to fight for its life but then that adrenaline itself has a toxic effect on the heart you know think of that broken heart syndrome the adrenaline actually literally has a damaging effect on the heart which is why when you look at heart failure patients one of the predictors of ending up in the hospital is a drop in their heart rate variability. And when you have a drop in your heart rate variability, it's because you have less vagus nerve tone and you have more sympathetic nerve tone. And so, you know, the, these different aspects, you know, whether it's the hypothalamic pituitary axis, whether it's, you know, the adrenal system, whether it's the sympathetic and uh, parasympathetic nervous systems, you know, all of these things interface. And again, it's not saying that stress is bad, but it is about that middle way. It is about, you know, um, that's why, you know, your body needs rest, your mind needs rest, your emotions need rest. And, you know, heart failure is kind of a good model that you can see these things at play, you know, and, and really how they bear themselves out because heart, heart, heart failure is one extreme of what happens to the heart when it's just been overworked for too long. In, in question, you talked about beta blockers. I'm going to kind of bring some pharmacology into this. Have you ever seen with some of these, I have a lot of clients, you know, they get prescribed with SSRIs and anti-anxiety medications. Do you see any, any correlation or any side effects from those medications on the electrophysiology of the heart or how that functions by changing certain molecules from a, a neural standpoint? I would say 
the, in, in my world, the main concern with some of those drugs mm -hmm. is its impact on the QT interval. There's a okay. parameter on the EKG called the QT interval. If that interval gets too long, you're at risk for uh, dangerous ventricular arrhythmias, one called torsades de point. And so many medications can prolong the QT interval, including something as simple as a Z pack for a cold. Oh, wow. But but the SSRIs and a lot of psychotropic drugs, you know, do have that ability to do that. So that that, that in, in the in the average person, it's not an issue. But if mm. someone has long QT syndrome or someone has other QT prolonging drugs that are on board, you know, that can be an issue. But if you look at if someone if if someone has depression, depression is associated with increased risk of cardiovascular events. Mm -hmm. So if you're treating someone's mental state and you're helping to improve it, that's going to have a positive impact on cardiovascular well-being. But as far as me mechanistically, the impact of altering brain serotonin levels and its impact on the cardiovascular system from a molecular or histological level or something. I'm not aware of anything that has specifically shown that. I will say that, you know, we have a condition called vasovagal syncope, which is basically people pass out when they see the sight of blood or they pass mm -hmm. out when they're experiencing pain or they pass out when they're in a warm environment or where they're standing in church. And, and in those cases, they pass out because of a reflex between the brain and the heart that, that basically the stress of whatever it is causes the heart to contract harder. And uh -huh. that sends these impulses to part of the, 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 the sort of CNS reflex that will cause the blood pressure and heart rate rather than go up, they paradoxically drop. And when you give beta blockers, those will block adrenaline's effect from causing an aggravated or, or over response and would prevent people from passing out. So interestingly, beta blockers, even though they lower heart rate and blood pressure, they actually help prevent vasovagal events in some patients when the vasovagal event is triggered by a high state of adrenaline. And similarly, we use SSRIs. I think Zoloft was the one that was studied that actually, or maybe it was Paxil, that showed reduction in vasovagal events. But that's not specifically the heart. That's involving the brain and the heart with the neurocardiogenic reflex. And I think that's, it's kind of, you know, where I was going with this because to respect the heart, you have to respect the brain to respect the yeah. brain. You have to respect the heart because we have this lovely vagus nerve that, that controls a lot, not just those two, everything else in the system. And it talks to each other. I think that's uh, people often forget or the, Oh, I want to treat the brain. I want to treat the heart, but we have to treat the whole system as is. Oh, to no, totally. I mean, speaking of the vagus nerve, like, vagus nerve is heavily involved in cardiac arrhythmias. Atrial fibrillation, here's a good example of how too much vagus is not good. So you can have states of hypervagotonia. We have a lot of these athletes, these endurance that athletes that have low resting heart rate due to high vagal tone. And once they start hitting their 40s and 50s and 60s, they're having AFib. We're seeing it all over the place. And there's a lot of different theories about that. But one thing we know for sure is that the vagus nerve, if it's too active, it can act as a risk factor or a potential trigger for cardiac arrhythmias because the vagus nerve slows the heart rate. So if the heart rate gets slow enough, especially at night, it's easier for premature beats, premature atrial beats to kick in and trigger an episode of arrhythmia. So vagus nerve, wonderful thing. It's a protective element, but it's also all about that seesaw and not wanting to get too much on one or the other. The other thing is the GI system and the cardiovascular system, the vagus nerve, you know, kind of cross talks on both systems. So we'll have people who have a large meal, stimulates the GI tract, and that stimulates their AFib. Hmm. Or we'll have someone who has a large meal and it'll stimulate an episode of vasovagal syncope, for example. So, you know, we talked about these systems, you know, the enteric nervous system is a fascinating one. And just like you have bad bacteria in your colon, that have bad byproducts that will directly affect your limbic system and your amygdala. So you know, it's amazing how what you eat can literally impact how you think and feel. And you know, there's there's definitely connections between the enteric nervous system and stress and the enteric nervous system and the oh, cardiovascular yeah. system. And for the for the athletes that have low resting heart rate, is that because they're they're using that cardiovascular system almost too much there that's, that's a great question they're adapting to it too well you know it's not clear and i certainly am not discouraging people from no. being athletic i think it's more complex i think no. that genetics 
is, is genetics. We know a lot about genetics in AFib, but there's a lot we don't know. And we definitely see genetics in families. So the people, the athletes that tend to get AFib, in many cases, there is a family history of AFib. There are okay. certain there's certain mutations, sodium channel, cardiac IM channel mutations that are associated with AFib. But then the other one is sleep apnea. There are so many athletes out there, people are getting AFib, and they actually had sleep apnea as the reason why they got AFib. It wasn't just their vagus nerve. It was but but we do have a subset of athletes where they it's to such a degree the endurance, athleticism yeah. and the stress that it's just ultimately it's just bad for the body, you know, just which, bad for the joints. It's bad for the heart, which is crazy. I mean, I've read a couple of running books. I mean, the ultra ultra running books and that you, you see that happen to some runners and you're like, wow. Cause I will be, we don't been taught like cardiovascular system training is good, but if you overdo it, it's almost like, I mean, there's multiple factors that play in here, but it's, wow. It's a crazy to think that the system, you can overdo it on both ways. You can't just yeah. be on the end of the extremes. No, that's absolutely right. That's where it gets back to this notion of homeostasis, that the body, the mind, everything wants to go back to kind of a, a, a baseline state. And what you really are trying to do is always get yourself back to that baseline state. And it's different for everyone. You know, some people are just naturally really, you know, hyper and go-getters, and some people are more kind of chill. And there's nothing wrong with either one. But you just want to avoid getting up. And, and we're all going to end up falling off the wagon. I mean, we're all going to yeah. end up... And, and I think that's the important thing is you got to give yourself some grace, you know, but it does, it does pay to get informed. It does pay to start, you know, learning about this stuff, talking to other people about this stuff, you know, keeping each other accountable, that there is something to be said for how the internal world of our bodies, our minds is, is, is many, very much a reflection of the outside world and vice versa. There's a reason why there's a reason why Marie Kondo is so successful yeah. with her. Her book is right. people, you feel better when you organize the space around you. You know, there's a certain sense and, you know, whether that has to do good with, you know, feel good hormones that are getting released or whatever it is, but there is something to be said for when your external environment is kind of in better balance, your internal environment will be that way. And, you know, sometimes, you know, one thing that we didn't talk about, but sometimes it, it, from a health standpoint, it's hard for people to get on track because of the environment they're in, you know, whether it's, you know, what's available at home, the snacks and all the stuff that's sitting around, you know, sometimes it, it can be a real challenge and there's not an easy solution to that. But I, I do always advise people always be thinking about, you know, when you're, when you're not on a good health path, you know, what are the things that are in your control and what are the things that are not? And also just making those small steps and celebrating those small wins. You know, I had a guy earlier today, I saw just a little while ago before hopping on with you. And, you know, he, he lost all this weight a few years ago and it was great. But then he got COVID, he gained all the weight back. And then I started asking him and, and he's in a rhythm called atrial flutter that I'm going to be ablating soon. And he, I asked him, you know, how much do you drink? And he's like, four drinks a day. And oh. It's like, you know, that's, that's a lot. And I was like, you know, there's a term called holiday heart that we use as a, that's what AFib is often triggered by. And I was like, you know, you're not going to what I have to say here, but if you want to avoid multiple surgeries, the best thing you can do is, is stop drinking. That's the thing that people don't get. Even people in my field, there's this idea of just getting fixed and being out the door, get an ablation, get an angioplasty, whatever, and you're done. And the answer is the disease process continues. You have to work on the lifestyle and the risk factors in the diet. Otherwise, it will come back. And then what happens is people get frustrated and upset that their disease came back. Well, I mean, if you don't change the path, you know, you know, you know, a lot of medicine is just like a sort of secondary prevention, but you really have to go after. It. And it's not easy. That's the problem is that, you know, healthy foods. I mean, it's it's when you're when you're busy and you don't have time to cook. I mean, these things are not easy things to do. And, and that's where, you know, you have to just kind of keep going. We just do the best that we can. And you said earlier in the podcast, aware, just have that awareness of yeah. that mindfulness and awareness to have that mental, to start to have some sort of mental fortitude to create that change or to create what your path looks from a health standpoint. Yeah. And I know I've been taking an hour ish of your time and I really appreciate it. Anything else that you want to get on or talk about 
Yeah, I would just encourage people really to focus in on their mental and emotional health. You know, there's there's lots of, you know, great resources out there, lots of great podcasts. I will say that knowing that all of these things are trainable, you can train yourself in being compassionate to yourself or other people. You can do compassion practices, you know, just, just you can get physically fit. You can get mentally fit. You can get emotionally fit. You can get emotionally agile. All of these things are things that you can do that as human beings, we have the ability to do. And it's just a matter of taking a chance and, and taking that first step. You know, whatever that, whatever that looks like for you and, you know, feel free, you know, to share the information about my book, you know, with your listeners, restart your heart, the playbook for thriving with AFib. You can get it on Amazon. My website is drasimdesai.com. I have a lot of uh, content on there about mental health and, and cardiac health and the connection between the two. So if people want to learn more, they can message me through social media channels and through the website. Awesome. Well, we appreciate you coming on and chatting with us. Thank you so much, Eric. I'm just going to hit end record. And what we'll do, let me just end.